Welcome back. In this video 4.1, we'll explore ethical egoism, which is the idea that morality is all about self-interest. This is an opportunity for you to more deeply explore the relationship between self-interest and your moral beliefs. Ethical egoists believe morality should be all about self-interest, so the right act is the one that's in your long-term self-interest. There are many arguments in support of some form of ethical egoism, and Ayn Rand is one famous advocate for it. Your life, after all, is all that you have, so why sacrifice it for another? How can that be good, to sacrifice it? You follow moral and legal rules because they are in your self-interest in obvious and subtle ways. You sacrifice your current self for your future self because it's in your self-interest. So self-interest is powerful, good, and important, but can all of morality rest on it? Well, the ethical egoist thinks so. Now, the lecture that follows will mostly be a critique of ethical egoism. I'll present several arguments against it, and I believe three are quite strong. As you consider these arguments, keep the following three points in mind. Number one, this video is relevant to one part of Ayn Rand's morality, but not to her politics so much. I believe Ayn Rand has many valuable insights, though I disagree with her on some points, especially on moral matters and relationships. So keep that in mind. Second, notice that the ethical egoist is making a much stronger claim, a more absolutist claim, than the non-egoist. So the egoist is claiming all of morality should be based on self-interest, whereas the non-egoist is arguing that pursuing self-interest alone will not lead to a fulfilling life. So the non-egoist will argue that morality involves sometimes, but not always, acting against your self-interest for the good of others. So the non-egoist is balancing self-interest right, with altruism in their morality, whereas the egoist is saying you should always be self-interested. Finally, the third point is one book I recommend to students for this unit is Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor with an introduction by Charles Guignon. It's a powerful book and one theme it covers is egoism. Dostoevsky shows the type of life that egoism leads to and in the process critiques it at a deeper level, a more existential level from the inside out. It critiques it at a deeper level than I can in this video. I'm merely taking an analytical approach. So again, this aspect of the course is analytical, involving the prefrontal cortex. <laughs> to me, it feels a lot like playing chess, and I think it can be beneficial, but I don't, I don't think it gets to the heart of morality, but I'll explain that later. Let's begin these criticisms. The first problem with ethical egoism is that ethical egoism implies that rape is okay if it's in your self-interest. Genocide is okay if it's in your self-interest. Murder is okay if it's in your self-interest, and so on. So how does the egoist respond? Well, they could respond in one of two ways. First, they could argue that these things really are good, which is not a good way to respond. Second, they could argue that those acts, rape, genocide, murder, and so on, are not really in your self-interest. However, that is more difficult than it sounds. It seems like, let's say we're in World War II and I've been ordered to kill some prisoners. It seems like it really is in my self-interest because if I don't, I may be killed or my family may suffer or my group. Second, you are often presented in daily life with cases in which, oh, you could sell this car to this person for a higher price, which would be in your self-interest, but it would be cheating them. It would be hurting them. And so, according to ethical egoism, that would be right if it's in your self-interest. And so, ethical egoism seems to just fail to account for the most basic aspects of morality. Again, the ethical egoist may argue that it's not really in your self-interest to cheat them, because if people found out, you would lose business. But if you just cheated one, and you knew you wouldn't get caught, and you're not going to lose business, and so it's in your self-interest, let's say, why is that wrong? It reminds me of an old joke. Friends help you move, but good friends help you move bodies. The second objection is the posterity objection. So posterity is the future, your grandchildren, great-grandchildren, or just the future 100 years from now, let's say. Most of you feel like you have a moral duty to the future, to posterity. For example, you clean up the environment for them, or you try to get rid of the national debt for them so they don't have to pay. But if ethical egoism is correct, you don't have any obligations to the future because you, yourself, will be dead. How can it be self-interested to have obligations to the future after you're gone? The fact that you want to help them is not what makes it self-interested. What would make it self-interested is if your want has the aim of helping yourself and not just them for their own sake. Again, an ethical egoist should not care about the future and posterity because she will be dead in the future. 
Now the ethical egoist could counter that their self includes their grandchildren, but notice how they have inflated the meaning of self to meet the posterity objection. If you allow this inflated definition of self, the theory is now closer to utilitarianism than ethical egoism. It reminds me of a saying by Groucho Marx, why should I care about posterity? What have they ever done for me? <laughs> At this point, a third criticism arises because there is an equivocation with the word self. That is, they're using the word self or, or self-interest in two different ways. So let me say this. If an act is self-interested, it doesn't mean that the desire comes from me. It means the desire is about me. This is the most common mistake I see people make. Again, the fact that a desire is mine, that it's from the self, does not make it selfish. It's selfish only if the ultimate aim of the desire is me. For example, if I want to help you because it makes me feel good, if that's the sole reason, then it's a bit self-interested or self- But if I want to help you, even if it doesn't make me feel good, or primarily simply because it's good for you, then it's not self-interested, even though the desire comes from me. It's what I want to do. The fact that you want to do something doesn't make it selfish or self-interested. There's a fourth criticism that arises here about what do we mean by self. So in Buddhism, there's the idea of no self. You can enter a type of awareness in which the self is an illusion. The problem for egoism is it does not seem I can be self-interested if I have no self. In Judeo-Christianity, there are similar ideas in the mystic literature. That there's this idea of death and of the self and the rebirth of a new type of being or awareness. And this awareness is something like love and includes the ability to see body, mind, and emotions without identifying with them. Ordinary ideas of self dissolve away. So how can such an awareness seek self-interest if this awareness simply is not a self? Defining and believing in a self is a problem for ethical and psychological egoism. There are also atheists who talk about no self, you know, Sam Harris. So again, it's hard to be self-interested if it's correct that we have no self. The next criticism against ethical egoism is that the ethical egoist is not capable of true love or deep friendship. So true friendship means caring about your friend's good for her own sake, not simply for the self-interested benefit you receive from her. This type of true love or friendship seems to be beyond the reach of the egoist because it requires you to sometimes transcend self-interest. So there seems to be something more than self involved in the deepest forms of human love and friendship. Love sometimes involves surrendering the self and letting go, not simply seeking self-interest. Some of the most beautiful passages in the wisdom traditions are when one loses all sense of self and suddenly truly sees the other. A love then awakens in which they care about the other for their own sake and not simply for how the other may benefit them. So you no longer see through the eyes of self. And this experience is one, the psychological, is one that psychological and ethical egoists cannot acknowledge or comprehend. James Rachels, in his book, The Elements of Moral Philosophy, and he believes this is the deepest criticism, he says the ethical egoist is like racist, sexist, ethnocentrist who divide the world up into us, them, and, and they say we're better than them because we're us and they're them. Well, the ethical egoist is similar. The ethical egoist divides the world up into me and everyone else. And you ask them, well, why do only me count? Why does only me count? Why? And the egoist says, well, because they're my interests, my desires, my thoughts. But this answer is really no better than the racist answer that my group is better because it's my group. The point of morality is to care about the well-being of people, all people, not simply yourself. So think of the people you've encountered today. Do their interests not count? Do you not care about them? Don't others have feelings, goals, pains, pleasures, and interests just like you? Why should your pain count for more than their pain simply because it's your pain? Isn't the starving child sometimes on par with your own interests? The point is that it's too simplistic to say morality is always about self-interest. When you think morally, you are considering your interests, that's true, but you are also considering the interest of others for their own sake. This just is morality. Of course, it does not follow from these examples that you must always sacrifice your own interests. Rather, it only shows that their interests count too, in an intrinsic way. As Lawrence Hinman says, self-love is a virtue, but it's not the only virtue. So in a way, this criticism shows that ethical egoism does not even enter the moral sphere. It doesn't enter the moral sphere of thinking because moral thinking begins when we start considering other people's interests for their own sake and not simply our own.
Some students get confused here and they say, but isn't ethical egoism simply putting yourself first? No, ethical egoism is the idea that it's always morally right to put your interests first. The best alternative to ethical egoism is not always being altruistic. The best alternative is recognizing that it's morally right to pursue your self-interest, but it's sometimes morally right to sacrifice a self-interest for the interest of others. That is, we must avoid the false dilemma of thinking the two options are to always seek self-interest or to never seek it. If extreme altruism is the only option, then egoism looks good. But there's another option. It's sometimes moral to act in your self-interest and sometimes immoral. The egoist is incorrect in saying it's always moral to act in your self-interest. Okay, so this gives you a feel for some of the common arguments against ethical egoism. You can see my longer video for more of the strengths and weaknesses. But here's my conclusion. Ethical egoism rightly emphasizes the importance of self. But it goes too far in implying that morality is nothing but self-interest. Even if the egoist could clearly define the self, egoism implies immoral acts like rape and genocide are good if they are truly in your self-interest. This theory, therefore, is not an adequate explanation of your morality, nor is it a good guide to life. Now, to defend ethical egoism, you will need to assume some moral axioms about the dignity and intrinsic value of each person. It's impossible to derive this intrinsic value of other people from reason or egoism alone. Reason and egoism only support the instrumental value of a people. That is, egoism must exist within a moral framework, which means it simply cannot explain the whole of your morality. That is, for those ethical egoists who accept that rape is wrong, genocide, and all these other horrible evils, those are just axiomatically wrong. They're not deriving that they're wrong from self-interest. They're just wrong, even if they're in your self-interest. And so that type of egoism is not really a complete egoism. There's a part of their morality that's based on something other than egoism, other than self-interest. It's the part that takes rape or genocide or what have you as wrong, even if you think it's in your self-interest sometimes. So as you further explore your morality, I think you will find that you feel a moral obligation to take care of yourself. But I think you will also find that your morality has many roots, and not all of them are based on self-interest. Now I leave you with the following paradox. You will miss the best things in life, including some truths, if you are always self-interested. Now, is that a self-interested reason not to be self-interested? Thanks.